So after living in the South Pacific for several years, I had returned to the Northern Hemisphere, to the island nation of the Marshall Islands. The capital of the Marshall Islands is Majuro, and that's where my boat was. Uh, one of my main reasons for coming to the Marshall Islands is that it was very closely affiliated with the United States so that I knew that I would be able to work here and uh, I really needed to get some funds to continue to fix my boat because it still had some major repairs to be done and also it was an area that I was familiar with because I had lived here 40 years previously and I really liked it so a little while after I, I got there I got a job at the college and uh, I was teaching aquaculture, anatomy and physiology, and general biology. Now, this is a rather small college, but it was quite nice. They gave me this office, which I thought was really spectacular. This is the view from my office, and you could see uh, out into the Pacific Ocean. And it was really uh, a lot nicer than some of the other colleges that I had taught at. And they gave me some nice facilities, and I had access to transportation, boats, and so forth. This is my anatomy and physiology class, where I taught the students about the human body. And this is my aquaculture class. We did a lot of field trips together, which was really fun, going to various aquaculture facilities. And this was the bus. The college had a dedicated bus for field trips. This was one of the field trips to a, a, a aquaculture facility to grow giant clams. And these clams were used for the aquarium trade. They're really beautiful. They have a type of algae within their flesh which allows them to uh, obtain food from the sun. You can see the, the beautiful colors. That's due to the pigments in the algae. And so these clams are spawned in captivity and they are uh, grown from uh, you know, obviously from hatchlings to uh, to a fairly large size. Here's one about ready to be shipped. Uh, we also did something with aquaria. So we purchased three aquaria, and I had the students set up their own tanks. Uh, this rock inside it was from the coral reef right outside. It's called live rock, and it's uh, a very good way to filter the water. Here we are before class, it was a morning class, went out to the reef and obtained, they're, they're sort of like boulders, they're loose boulders and they have living organisms on them. Here the students are removing some of the organisms that we don't want in the aquaria and this guy is looking at the salt water to see that it's the proper salinity and here he is again. Now we did do field trips, this one was to a a place in the lagoon where they were growing a type of fin fish and this net over the top was to keep the birds out and here's the class we're sitting in front of the, uh, the one of the pens we also did a trip to a nearby atoll and so we had access to a uh, sort of a speed boat because the other atoll was about 15 miles away it's called Arno Atoll and we're going underneath the bridge uh, there's one road that circles the atoll. Here we're going underneath it, and now we're out into the, uh, the open ocean. And pretty soon we were on Arno Atoll, where the facility was. And it was a beautiful little atoll. Not many uh, tourists go there. The hatchery is another place that was growing giant clams. And so I had the students uh, we, we kind of went out and collected some clams from the reef and witnessed the uh, spawning of giant clams. And here's my class. We're snorkeling, looking for some clams. Uh, what, what's done is that the clams are essentially one is sacrifice. They take the gonads and they blend it up and they squirt it uh, near another uh, clam and that induces spawning. So then you have uh, the eggs and the sperm, which are gathered together, and they're um, placed in the hatchery. Go see. 
see that the noise is going to be a lot less because now the boat is inside the lagoon and you can see the town or the city of Majro. Well, I still had a lot of work to do in the boat. So when I wasn't teaching at the college, I would try to put things together. And as always, things are hard to find on these uh, types of places. So you have to kind of make do with what you've got. But I did order a furler, which is a pretty important part. It connects the top of the mast to the front of the boat, and it holds a sail called the jib, and it rolls it up. Now here you see the jib all rolled up, and that's really good because you can sort of stow it that way, and you can also reduce the amount of sail that's out. Prior to this, I had to just uh, essentially run up to the front of the boat and tackle the sail and pull it down. So it finally became time to leave the Marshall Islands, and I was going to be going, well, I thought to the Philippines, but first I had to cross Micronesia, and the first stop was going to be Ponape, an island that I had been to uh, many years, about 40 years previously. Now you can see the, uh, the two sails, the main sail, and the one to the right is the uh, foresail or the, or the jib. And that black pole, sort of horizontal that you see, that was something I made also. It's called a whisker pole, and I made out of a bunch of stuff that I found around. And uh, I ended up having a little bit of trouble with it. It worked great at first, but, you know, as always, the, the one that I had had been destroyed and was actually stolen uh, the, after it had been destroyed. So I had to, I was forced to make one. So I put this one together, and it lasted all the way to Ponape and beyond. So here I am coming into Ponape. It's a beautiful island. It's really known for this uh, rock at the uh, mouth of the bay called Soke's Rock. Here's the inner lagoon, and that's my boat right in the middle. Uh, climbed up the hills and took some pictures of the uh, surrounding area. Now, this is a big World War II battle site, so there's a, still a lot of the machinery, guns, cannon, tanks, and so forth. So, uh, pretty much uh, many places you can see these things. This is another site uh, where the, the guns are essentially left in place. Well, they had the, the Ponopeans transport these giant guns, uh, the Japanese did. Of course, this was a Japanese uh, fortification. So uh, one day I went out with my kayak and I had heard that there was a waterfall, but nobody could quite give me uh, good directions to it. So I just started uh, paddling around and it was really nice. It was in the mangroves. And finally, I heard some, some noise and I came across this waterfall, nice little waterfall. Now this is a much more famous waterfall in Ponape, and uh, I went there with a, a guide, a taxi driver, and we just uh, kind of took some pictures of it. You can see it's uh, quite amazing. There were also petroglyphs in this area, things that had been carved by people a long time ago. But one of the things that Ponape is really known for is called Nan Madal. It's like a fortress made, well, like a thousand years ago. And it's made from these giant uh, blocks of basalt, which were transported many, many miles. Uh, they still don't know exactly how they did it, but they, they probably floated them on bamboo rafts. And then they put them together to form these forts. And, you know, uh, the royalty lived in some of the places. Some of them were for storage of food and so forth. So Ponape is a very lush island. One day we went out and went scuba diving to the other side of the island. The, the water was very clear. And this area was known uh, for having a lot of manta rays. Here you see a couple of them. And manta rays are, they're pretty large. They're related to sharks. They have cartilage for skeleton rather than bony, uh, bony skeleton.
So these manta rays feed on plankton and they essentially try to remain in one place and let the uh, current bring the plankton to them. They have a big scoop in the front of their head which opens up into their digestive tract so they can swallow the plankton. I did some walks around the neighborhood. The houses were very nice and almost always they had great landscaping, very colorful. The center of town was dominated by this old Spanish church. This is where uh, they had uh, baseball fields and I think it probably dates back about 300 years or so. I went to uh, a place where they're having a, a celebration. So finally it was time to leave Ponape and as I said I was heading towards the Philippines but I was going to try to make it to Yap first. But it was a long way, it was uh, at least a couple thousand miles and I had some problems on the way. As I said that pole uh, actually broke and the lines that you see there kind of hooked that solar panel there, flipped it over, uh, smashed it, the sail tore and of course the pole was thrashing around the boat and it happened at night of course so it was uh, pretty um, you know it was it was really my fault I should have kept a closer eye on those lines and I shouldn't have had the solar panel up but you know the thing is I had to go somewhere for repair so I, I stopped into Chuck it used to be called truck and uh, a lot of people bypass Chuck it has a reputation for being kind of unfriendly towards sailors, but I found it to be pretty nice. And uh, except for this wall, which is where I had to tie up, so there's a pretty strong surge. But I was able to work on the sail and to uh, repair or repair some of the damage, let's say. And at night, the boats, like all these islands, now I. Um, Chuk is really famous for its diving because the World War II Japanese fleet was attacked there by the U.S. Uh, military during World War II. This is a Japanese first aid kit. And so there are many boats that have been sunk there. It was called Operation Hailstorm. And uh, just a tremendous number of uh, Japanese lost their lives. These are some, some bones in one of the boat, boats that I uh, dove on. And uh, I think this was like an infirmary. A lot of sea life on these boats also. These are some spade fish. This is a telegraph that is still working. This is the Fujikawa Maru. Uh, and it's, it's fairly shallow. On this dive, we're going to enter into the uh, structure of the boat. There's still a lot of things intact inside. So I believe these are beer bottles and pretty soon you'll see there's a, uh, I guess it's like a bathroom or a infirmary that we'll be going into. You'll see the porcelain sinks and things like that. Here I believe it are the sinks and toilets and I, there's a uh, sort of a bathtub like thing made of porcelain that's still intact.
So I got to do a few dives while I was in Chuck, but I'll be continuing with this journey in a little bit. So I hope you like this and please subscribe. Bye.